So now I'd like to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Guda Lunas. He's had an incredible impact on the multi-generations of college students during his time spent as American history professor at College of the Desert right here in the Coachella Valley. And I was the benefit to be one of those students. His love for the subject, engagement with those he's teaching, the entertaining and humorous style made him a campus favorite. Dr. Guda, Dr. Guda Lunas is retired from full-time teaching and now lives on the East Coast with his wife, Barbara, but returns to Rancho Mirage each year to provide unique insight to our country's history. I have no doubt you'll enjoy this week's program. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Guna Lunas. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, really good to be back. I missed it last year. I missed teaching so much. So thank you. Thank you for uh, coming in. And uh, we're going to talk, and, and I hope everything's working here. I can't see it. But uh, how the United States, how we went from 13 little colonies all cooped up, so to speak, be, uh, east of the Appalachian Mountains, how we got to be as large as we are. And uh, most people would say that there are three reasons we became so successful and so large, really. Uh, first of all, manifest destiny, American exceptionalism. I, I think anybody, and I want to be fair here, I want to be like all politicians, I want to tell the truth. Uh, I want to be transparent. Uh, I don't want to be uh, critical race theory or woke or anything else. I just want to be a stupid Lithuanian and be honest and dumb enough to be honest. Okay. Uh, one, and this is somewhat true, manifest destiny, which became very, very strong feeling in the United States in the middle of the 19th century, middle of the 1800s. It manifest destiny, in our way of thinking, meant it was God's destiny. It was manifest, obvious destiny, uh, that we take over all of the North American continent. We extend from sea to shining sea, from Canada to Mexico, and at one time we wanted Canada. Might still do it. Uh, we wanted Mexico. Now, you're going to hear tomorrow about the All of Mexico movement. When we won the Mexican War in the 1840s, some people said, take all of Mexico. And we said, no, we'll only take the good parts and we'll leave the rest. Uh, but uh, yeah, we claimed, and, and rightly so, you'd have to be nuts to say the United States isn't the greatest country that ever existed. I have to say that. We, 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 what we've done for the world in science and medicine and the arts and space exploration and our generosity throughout history, especially with the beginning at the end of World War II, the Marshall Plan, all of our foreign aid now, we've, uh, it's magnificent. I, I, I just defy anybody uh, to name any two or three other countries combined that have done the good we have done, and I have to say that. But have we been perfect? No. So that's American exceptionalism. We are proud of ourselves. Uh, when we move west uh, and, and push the Indians farther and farther west and eventually in the reservations and eventually in the casinos, uh, they got even with us big time. Uh, Richard Milanovic did more damage than Geronimo, that, that's for sure. All right, but, uh, but, but anyway, uh, we, 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 our argument was, look, we're really doing them a favor. We're white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people. We're the best people in the world. So when we, if we take you over, it's actually good for you. In the long haul, you're going to be better off under our rule. And I would argue that for the most part, would have California developed like we did if we'd been ruled by the Indians or the Spanish? I doubt it. Uh, so you have to be honest there. But that does, it, it, what I'm saying now wouldn't go over very well in France or Mexico or even Canada, uh, for goodness sakes. What's the difference between a Canadian and a canoe? The canoe tips once in a while. Uh, I had a lot of waitresses in class, you know. Yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, so American exceptionalism manifests as he, and by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that, an adulteration of that word or phrase, uh, Hitler called Aryans uh, in the pre-World War II and World War II times. Uh, Angles and Saxons were these Germanic tribes, uh, Nord Nordic type people, fair skinned, light haired, for the most part, sometimes blue eyed uh, people from Northern uh, Europe type people that came and, and basically conquered Europe, 
overthrew the Roman Empire, settled on the island of Great Britain, and, and, and by 1776, when we became an independent country, virtually all of us were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Now, I'm white, poor example of one, but I'm white, but I'm not an Anglo-Saxon, I'm not a Protestant. All right, Protestants wouldn't take me, I had to be Catholic. Okay, uh, so I like going, you know, uh, that's how I play golf, here, there, everywhere. Okay, but anyhow, anyhow, uh, why, uh, the Angles and Saxons, we, we were 78, or we were 90 some percent Anglo Saxon in 1776. The, the, those of us who were not from the Great Britain, which is England, Scotland, and Wales, the island of Great Britain, sort of people that are British are technically English, Scotch, or Welsh. Right? So, and most of us were either. Britons or Germans. The, the second greatest group over here in 1776 were the Germans. And most of the Germans who came over prior to the 1850s were Protestant Germans. So we, the Germany is still about half Catholic, half Protestant. But we were wine Anglo-Saxon Protestant people. We were products of the greatest, freest country in the world at that time, England. Uh, we, we had this tremendous land. We were 3,000 miles away from the government. Most of you conservative Republicans ought to like that one. How would you like the power? The, the, the king couldn't do anything. Was, oh, you were going to tax us, George. The hell you are. Uh, we ain't paying. Okay, so... Uh, we were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, we had a great educational system. It was our destiny, our God-given destiny, uh, to become the greatest country in the world, which we did, uh, to expand at least from coast to coast, which we did, uh, at least take everything between Canada and Mexico, and as you're going to see, we darn well tried to come. We took half of Mexico uh, in the 1840s, and we invaded Canada on several occasions. In fact, uh, up until the 20th century, well into the 20th century, Canada had money budgeted every year in their, their annual budget uh, in case they were invaded by their neighbors from the south. And that didn't mean Nicaragua. Uh, th that meant the United States. We invaded Canada. The first thing we did, the American Revolution, 1775, right after Lexington and Concord, a guy named Benedict Arnold, who was our greatest general until he committed treason. Arnold led an invasion of Canada. We thought we could take Quebec. Uh, he failed. Uh, he was wounded severely, but we tried. Uh, the War of 1812, first thing we did, every school kid learns the War of 1812 was caused by impressment, the British impressing our seamen. I remember my buddy Earl was asked by one of our teachers, what's impressment? Earl? I can't impress, I'm Catholic. I can't do that. All right, so, uh, but you know, yes, we were. About 8,000 Americans were impressed by the British in two or three years preceding the War of 1812. But the, but the second cause of the war, and I think the major cause, is we darn well wanted to take Canada. Uh, England still owned Canada totally until 1867 when it got dominion status. But the first thing we did in the War of 1812 was not try to fight the British Navy. They had 800 ships, we had 15. Who's going to win that one? All right, but the first thing we did is invade Canada. Failed, but we tried, all right? And uh, even during the 1830s, there were some attempts by private Americans indirectly sponsored by the government called filibusters. Now that's something in the United States Senate, but filibustering back then meant kind of like a legalized bandit where you try to do something to help your country, but you're unofficially doing it. We even tried to invade Canada a couple of times in the 30s. So yes, a manifest destiny, that's one reason we grew. Were we the greatest people in the world? Yes. Did we have the greatest educational system? Yes. And have we done more for the world, I think, than any other country? Yes. All right? Now, but were we perfect? No. Were we? No. Uh, we, we also conquered a lot of these areas through thinly veiled imperialism at the expense of less advanced people. If you, if you, one day there was somebody on TV, a talking head, I won't tell you who he was, except he just paid out about 25 million women that he didn't harass. Uh, and his last name's O'Reilly. Okay, <laughs> other than that, I, uh, I, I won't tell you anything. But anyway, one day he said, the United States was never imperialist. What? Ask the Indians if we were imperialist. Ask the Mexicans if we were imperialists. Ask Canada if we were imperialists. Of course we were. But then again, most major countries in the world were at one time. Was in, hell, England, our mother country, was the most imperialistic country in the history of the world. The British Commonwealth, the British Empire, the sun never sets on England. And yet England did a lot of good too. And then the third reason that has come out in recent years, unadulterated pure luck. And I love this last line, 
taking advantage of European distresses. There's an old adage I learned from a professor, European distresses equal American successes. As you're gonna see in almost every one of these advances like the Louisiana Purchase and the Florida acquisition, the acquisition of Texas and California, we got lucky because of some things that were going on in England, either England or France or Spain couldn't concentrate on us 3,000 miles away and we took advantage of the situation. We, we were endowed with such natural resources, still are, that we didn't have to worry about you know, importing anything, we had enough of our own stuff. We, we had free immigration and open immigration, and we were very productive people. We, part of that manifest destiny, I'm not being a wise guy, was that we would outbreed everybody. Angles, Anglo-Saxon people would outbreed everybody of any color, of any ethnicity, except Lithuanians. All right, uh, so uh, amazing. But these, and later on in the 19th century, later on, there was uh, a concept advance called social Darwinism. Darwin, survival of the fittest, uh, struggle for existence, the only the fit will live and so forth. Uh, well, that was part of Manifest Destiny. Since we're a white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, with a great educational system, we're very inventive, we're everything, we're gonna dominate the world. I, and, and then we were lucky. Uh, Louisiana, as you're gonna hear today, Louisiana Purchase practically was given to us. We didn't, we didn't, Florida, we, we didn't buy Florida for five million. Spain gave it to us for nothing, including Governor DeSantis. Well, maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, not, not 100, but, but it did include Tom Brady, so that, uh, all right, where, uh, I'll, I'll get there. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Florida was given to us, Texas was practically given to us, Mexican War, uh, we only lost, uh, you know, less than 13,000 men to conquer a huge uh, empire, amazing. So we were, we were very lucky. Uh, no country was ever shined upon better than the United States, as some historians say. I never, and this is a true story. I know I think I told this story years ago, but people tend to forget what I said 10 minutes later, so I have to work. And I'm like Bob Hope, if I hit a good joke, I'll wear it out. All right, but I was in gra graduate class a few years, well, more than a few years ago. Uh, hell, I knew Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh, <laughs> My father killed him. No, no. Uh, oh, no, 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 that was Cruz. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I know I have that somewhere. But anyway, I, I knew Lee Harvey Oswald didn't do that, damn it. I knew it. All right. Uh, Otto von Bismarck, one of the greatest European statesmen, diplomats, war promoters ever. He created the modern German state as we know it in 1870 after he led Germany to a great victory over France in the Franco-Prussian War. Well, Bismarck united all these 39 or 40 German provinces in one huge Reich, which he called the Second Reich. And Hitler would then call his government the Third Reich. First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, which came many years ahead of that. Uh, that's why it's the Third Reich. Now in Germany, we have the Fourth Reich, but nobody's gonna call it that, are they? But that's why Hitler called it the Third Reich, because. Von Bismarck's was the second rig. Right, but anyway, Von Bismarck drank a lot and he was really exasperated one day. He fought these wars to gain inches and a couple miles in a province here and there. And finally he said, you know, look at the United States. They fought Mexico, a quick war, they have given Louis. He said, damn it, God takes care of three kind of people, makes them lucky, three kind of people. And somebody said, who Otto? And he said, fools, drunks, and Americans. And I heard that in grad class. And I got up and left. And Professor Haig said, where are you going, Galunas? You never left class like that. I said, you just said that fools, drunks, and Americans are lucky, right? He said, yes. I said, well, I'm going to casino, because I'm all three. I ought, to, I ought to be able to handle that one. All right, so anyhow, why did we expand? Because of manifest destiny? Yes, was it, were we God's chosen people? Were the Jewish people wrong? Was the Bible wrong? We manifest as if we're the chosen people. And in many ways, look at all the resources. Okay, uh, you know, I'm glad God put me in the United States. He could have put me here in the first place instead of in the coal regions, but we won't. I'll take that up with them when I get to the pearly gates. Okay, so uh, manifest destiny. Sure, we're imperialistic. We always had a decent military, 
and uh, we always had people that were willing to fight. Uh, during our early wars, we didn't have a large standing army, but we had these militias, which are now called the National Guard, and uh, they just salivated many of them for a chance to fight and make, you know, become heroes in their local towns and stuff like that. So we were out, and we always had the best weapons, the best guns. Uh, we were, we're still the arms supplier of the world, right? I know it's hard to get a gun in, in America. <laughs> Gotta, uh, okay, uh, who's that congressman? Bulbert, she, she says you, she has a bar where you have to have a gun when you go in. I could imagine my dad's bar back in Pennsylvania, everybody wearing a gun, that would have been neat. Uh, it wouldn't have had any population problem there. That would have been the end of our reproducing. Uh, all right, uh, so we are lucky and all that kind of stuff. Now, if anything symbolizes, could you see this lady? It, it's a good, good view. The lady, Lady Liberty or Miss Columbia. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't see what you could see. Uh, this picture was actually a lithograph produced in 1872 by a name, guy named John Gast. GST, but it symbolized as much as anything American greatness and manifest destiny. She, Miss Columbia, is obviously an Anglo-Saxon. She's very white, wearing a white dress, as you could see, right? Come on, get over there. Uh, she has light hair. I would have had her more blonde, uh, perhaps, than that. But Miss Clara, all it would, no one take about. I, and she's in this white dress that somehow amazingly hangs onto her body without falling off. Okay, and she's carrying a book, which many people think is a Bible. It's actually a school book. Which so she's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant woman who's very learned. Uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants love education. We did have the best educational system in the world, still do. Uh, so she's carrying a book. Uh, in her hand, she has telegraph wires. Who invented the telegraph? The United States. Who invented telephone? The United States. Who invented the electric fan? The United States. Who invented the COVID vaccine? The United States. Or Trump, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but anywho, uh, she's, and she, where, which way she's going? She's going from the east to the west. See how in the west, as she's coming west, you could see how the clouds are there. And there are these Indians running away. You could see, if you could really see the picture close up, they're kind of not well dressed and they're kind of crude and they're, they're running west, and she's, notice where she's coming from, where all the light is in the east. So she's bringing the glories of the east, uh, of our American civilization to the west. And notice she's le leading wagon trains and the Pony Express. You could see some riders back there. And in what's coming, trains. Did the Indians and the Mexicans out there have trains? And did they have uh, covered wagons and stagecoaches? Hell no. Did they have telegraphs? No. Did they have a public educational system? Them. No, we're coming out, and here she comes, and she's leading the pioneers, the hardworking Americans. Every one of these people has a shovel or a pick or something, and we're ready to go to work with the railroads coming, and, uh, and, and she's bringing the light to the West. And that, as much as anything else, symbolized manifest destiny. Again, this was a lithograph uh, production, and it wasn't really drawn up until 1872, but it, it really symbolizes uh, manifest destiny in the in other words, yeah, we're going to conquer the Indians, we're going to conquer the Hispanics out west, but it's going to be good for us and good for them. They're going to be better off under our civilization than, than they are un, under uh, the way they are now. Funny, nobody ever asked them, uh, but, uh, but that was our opinion. And now, there we go. All right. So far, so good? Okay. Now, the big turning point in world history, I think, was the so-called Seven Years' War, fought between 1756 and 1763. Here in North America, we called it the French and Indian War because we were still British subjects and we fought the French and their Indian allies. Most of the Indians in North America liked the French rather than the British because the French were fur traders and they, it was to their interest to get along with the Indians, right? The Indians had trapped the furs and the French would sell them, everybody's happy, sing Kumbaya, give the Indians a little fire water, and everybody's happy. The British come and what did the Indians, they're not stupid, what do they know? An Englishman's a farmer, Frenchman's a fur trader. Englishman's a farmer, what does a farmer need? Subsidies, no, I'm sorry. What, 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 what does a farmer need? 
land. So here's an, here's an Englishman, hey, he's going to want my land. Plus the English always look down on the Indians socially and every other way, not the French. Uh, I don't want to be a wise guy, but the French were much more willing to have uh, intermarriage, sexual intercourse with Indians than the British were. The British would ask you, haven't seen a woman in 20 months, uh, what's your lineage? Who's your father? Frenchman, turn around. Okay, uh, Frenchman, sex is sex, man, woman, in a pinch, an animal. Okay, uh, but uh, but but uh, so uh, the French and Indian War is going to be critical. Uh, this war, which some people call World War IV, and I had a professor who called it, and he wrote a 15 volume, and each volume is just thick, on that war back in the 1940s and 50s. He called it the Great War for Empire. So it's the French and Indian War. Uh, over in Europe, it's called Seven Years' War. We call it French and Indian. And Lawrence Henry Gibson, right after World War II, uh, popularized it as the Great, Great War for Empire. It would determine who would rule North America. It turned out the British, although they didn't hold on for too long. Uh, the reason I have that date, 1754, is that this war actually started here uh, in North America. And then in 1756, England and France, our mother countries, then declared war against each other, and it got into a war where England got Prussia to join her. Prussia was what was the biggest part of Germany at that time. France got Spain uh, and Austria and Russia to fight on her side. So it was a world war. Gibson called it World War IV. I'll list the nine world wars in a moment. But this, in many ways, was the pivotal war because it's going to set up the American Revolution, the French Revolution, uh, the modern German state. You could argue this was the most important war in world history. Very few people know about it. But it was the French and Indian War fought here. This is what North America looked like before the war. All that blue area was French. The British colonies were kind of cooped up, if you call it that. There are only about a million and a half of us, not counting slaves, east of the mountains. But this was all of New France, Canada. And, uh, that area out there was called Louisiana, named after King Louis. Uh, a lot of French names. Baton Rouge, Red Stick. Des Moines, some monks. Terre Haute, High Land, right? High Land, Terre Haute, yeah. And then the yellow area was Spanish. Okay, after the war, England won this war decisively. But remember, it was a world war. What's a world war? It involves all, many world powers, certainly this one, all, almost every world power at the time. It's fought in several different theaters. This was fought in Europe, in India, in the South Pacific to a limited extent, certainly in India. It was fought here in North America, a little bit in the islands of the Caribbean. So it was certainly a world war, and it was decisively ended, and England won it after a guy named Wolf took Quebec. You ever heard that? Wolf in Montcalm, Wolf going up that secret path to get to the heights of Quebec. I've never been to Quebec, but is that really high up and hard to get to? Is it? I mean, the plains of Abraham surround it, right? But it's hard to get up. But Wolf found a way to sneak up. God told him how to sneak up. God and an Indian scout. Uh, but, uh, but anyhow, the English decisively won the war. France decided she didn't want any more large landmass colonies and would not attempt to create any more for 100 years, till the late 1800s. So France gave all the land she had west of the river, she gave it to Spain. So you could see Spain, who was France's ally, gained a lot of land, what we now call Louisiana. We're going to buy that uh, from France because France is going to get it back. It's complicated. And all the land that France had east of the Mississippi River including Canada and all of what is now the United States and Florida were given to England. So all of a sudden, England rules Florida, all, all of what is now the eastern United States, and all of what was known as, of Canada at that time, Quebec, Montreal. One of the weird things about a Canadian map, if you don't understand it, is this area up here along the uh, uh, Nova Scotia, and that's called Lower Canada, and down here along the Great Lakes, it's called Upper Canada. And if, no, I, for years I've heard Canadians drinking too much Labatt's or what's... Uh, but it's because the St. Lawrence flows northeast. So the St. Lawrence River, actually, where it starts is the lower, is Upper Canada, and where it ends is lower, where the river... I never knew that until about 25 years ago. Uh, but anyhow, England all of a sudden has all that land. England has Canada. 
Uh, and uh, as far as England was concerned, Canada became the 14th colony. There were 13 American colonies. And Florida, for you people that uh, were from Florida, I know a lot of Florida, Floridians running around, especially in Delaware for some reason. But Florida was originally inhabited by Spain, conquered by or settled by Spain. After the French and Indian War, it was given to England. But after the American Revolution, 20 years later, it was given back to Spain. And then Spain gave it to us in 1819. So it's kind of complicated. That'll, that, that'll throw you for a loop. All right, so that's it. The French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, that's when England gains Canada and all the land, what is now the United States, eastern Mississippi River, and for about 20 years, England would actually control Florida. Okay. I think Marco Rubio knows all that. I have to ask him one day. When, when did Florida go back? All right. Uh, my son is a dean at Tampa Bay now. That's Championship City, though, isn't it? Uh, they kind of worked over my Eagles over the weekend. Eagles are good when they play somebody that's bad. All right. <laughs> now, these are the acquisitions we're going to make. That We were born a huge country. Look what we were in 1783 at the end of the Revolution. Look. My God, we were one of, we started out as one of the biggest countries in the world. There are only two and a half million of us Americans living in that area, not counting slaves. Look at that. I mean, there are two and a half million people in downtown Indio now, for God's sake. But all of that. Then in 1803, we're going to buy Louisiana from France. And then in 1819, Spain is going to give us Florida. Then we're going to fight the Mexican War. This is all in the 1800s, 19th century. We're going to fight the Mexican War, and we're going to take all of this, half of Mexico, this blue area, and all of what was then Texas. Texas gave up a lot of that land uh, when it became part of the United States. It became part, parts of New Mexico and other states. But this was the Mexican session of the 1840s, but that included te counting Texas and uh, as part of the Mexican session, we took 51% of Mexico. How do you teach this course in Mexico? When I came out here, I was very upset. I was worried about in, I, where I was originally teaching. There weren't very many Hispanics. And I was really worried about it, especially when I found out there was a Polk Street down in India or somewhere. Polk. Uh, Polk is the one the, the president the Mexicans ought to hate. He's going to come up in a minute. And I was really upset. How do you? And finally, some nice Hispanic guy came up to me and said, Doc, we don't give a damn. Why do you? <laughs> oh, so that put me back. Uh, then we also, in the 1840s, took Oregon. Uh, we took that green area called the Oregon country. It actually extended up to 5440. Uh, 54, 40 or fight you're going to hear about, but we settled. We took half of Oregon. England took the other half. So we picked up Oregon. We didn't get 54, 40, but we didn't get a fight in the 1840s. We split with England. Notice we compromised with England, and we fought a war with Mexico. Somebody asked Sam Houston, why did you do that? He said, it's simple, because England is strong and Mexico is weak. That's why we fought Mexico. Compromise with England. We're also smart. We aren't. A, then we also, you know, hardly anybody knows this, this little area here, which includes Yuma and Tucson, this area here, Route 8, I think, or what? Yeah, 8 goes through there. 10? 8. 8. Okay. Uh, that's the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, we bought that from Mexico. They gave it to us. They couldn't understand why we wanted it. Wanted to build a railroad through there in Los Angeles. I'll get into that. But that was the Gadsden Purchase because the guy that engineered it was a guy named James Gadsden, whose grandfather had created the Gadsden flag, which I'll show you that. Snake, don't tread on me. Uh, I, I don't want to screw around with this too much. So that's how we gained it. We're, and we also gained in 1898, we gained Hawaii during the Spanish-American War, which I'll talk about. We annexed Hawaii, uh, which we had really dominated anybody. But anyway, but part of the Spanish-American War was fought in the Philippines, and we needed a stopping off point between San Francisco and the Philippines, and that turned out to be Hawaii. So we annexed Hawaii. And then in 1867, prior to that, we had bought Alaska, Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox, uh, and uh, we bought that for $7,200,000. That cost us two cents an acre. 
And that was totally useless, wasn't it? Nothing in Alaska, right? And the Louisiana Purchase we got for three cents an acre. Three cents. And everybody thinks we paid 15 million for Louisiana Purchase. We actually paid Napoleon 11 million and assumed the debt he owed us of four million. He got 11 million for the whole thing, that's all. And Napoleon's smart. No wonder you're short. Yeah, no brain. Okay. So, let's go. And here's a good one. These are the presidents we acquired. If I go over, let me, oh no, I'm good. Uh, these are the presidents we acquired territory. The original United States. Under Thomas Jefferson in 1803, we bought Louisiana. That huge area there. Louisiana contains all of or part of 15 states. It was 828,000 square miles, 530 million acres for about three cents an acre. Imagine that. We got that under Jefferson. Then under James Monroe, who was president from 1817 to 1825, uh, we, had, we convinced the Spanish to give us Florida. We didn't pay them anything. Uh, five million was an assumption of damage claims, like the, we assumed four million in Napoleon's debt. And he also under Monroe, we made a treaty called the Treaty of 1818, which I will talk about very underrated, but that treaty gave us this area up here, uh, and it, it, it extended from the Lake of the Woods, which is just west of Lake Superior. I never knew how beautiful that area. I'm watching it on, I, I was Googling it. Oh my gosh, uh, that, that's a beautiful area. And it's the largest lake, freshwater lake in the United States, except for the Great Lakes, the Lake of the Woods. And I, you know, I'm probably most of them never heard of it. But from the Lake of the Woods, all the way over, to the Rocky Mountains, which were then called the Stonies, the 49th parallel was our border with Canada, 49 degrees north latitude. That border was later, uh, in the Oregon Treaty, that border was extended to the west coast, except it hooked down a little bit to give the British all of Vancouver Island. But so the 49th degree north latitude uh, is our now our boundary uh, with Canada and has remained that way. However, even though we did invade Canada a few times, Here's a trivia I can never forget from fifth grade. We bound Canada, counting Alaska, for 5,527 miles. 5,527 miles. And we were going to stop booze from coming through there during Prohibition. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Elliot Ness. He was a bigger drunk than me. Uh, you know, Elliot Ness was an alcoholic. Elliot Ness didn't put Al Capone away any more than I did. Some income tax guy did. Uh, but anyhow, I'm not, I'm not going to badmouth anybody here. 49th degree north latitude, right. And then that would extend all the way over. All right, and then under a guy named John Tyler, who was president of uh, Tippecanoe and Tyler too, he was elected on a ticket with Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Biden and Harris too. Trump and Pence too. Oh, not anymore, Pence, he's out. All right, but, uh, but Tippecanoe, well, Tippecanoe died a month in office. He was only president for a month, William Henry Harrison. Uh, he, at that time, was our oldest president, 69. And nobody was older until Reagan. And now look at it. You have to be 80 to run. Uh, I, I actually have hopes. Uh, my mother always said, when Kennedy was elected, you're going to be the next Catholic president. I go, oh, yeah, good. My mother was very humble. Uh, but now Biden went and ruined it on me. Uh, Joe's Catholic. I'm not so sure he knows it all the time. But, all right. My son's going to actually live near him, his second home now. It's going to be interesting. All right. But under Tyler and his successor, Polk, James Knox Polk, we took all of this land. And really, Texas, while it was the next, while the last days, literally the last couple days of Tyler's presidency, it was Polk's election that led to the annexation of Texas, which you're going to see leads to the Mexican War, which leads to us taking all of this stuff under Polk. And then under Polk, we also settled the Oregon argument. So under Polk, I would argue, look, all of this green stuff plus this. Was Polk a great president? He was a land-grabbing SOB. But he was my land-grabbing SOB. <laughs> what we need is him back. No, think of it. We could conquer all of Mexico, which he was in favor of, and we'd never lose in soccer. 
We dominate the Olympics in boxing. We'd win all the marathons, and then we could conquer Canada. And we'd dominate the Winter Olympics, and we'd never lose in the World Hockey Cup. So we got to bring back James Knox Polk. Oh, I'm telling you. And he, he, Polk was an interesting guy. He promised only to serve one term. And he left office. He was not yet 50. He was 49 when he left office. And he, he had four things he was going to do, which I'll get into. But he did them. Did them, including taking Texas and California and Oregon. And he said, I'm going to go home. That's it. I don't want a pension, nothing. I'll see it. And he leaves. He's not yet 50 years old. He goes home. Doesn't run for re-election. Keeps his word. And dies two months later. So we never had to pay his anything. They, they, Congress wouldn't vote his widow a pension until years later. But so how about that? Go do your job. Do exactly what you say. Four things. I'm going to do it. He did it. Goes home. Dies. Gets out of our hair. That's what you call a good present. And, uh, but he was a slave owner. And he was an imperialist, no question. He was our most imperialistic president. And uh, when I was in grad school, I hate to keep saying that, he was ranked like fifth or sixth greatest president we had. Now he's down in the 20s somewhere because of the way he, of course, treated Mexico. He wasn't very nice to the Indians. Same thing with Andrew Jackson. When I was mentioning, if you don't think we were imperialist, uh, ask the Indians. Well, what did Jackson do to the Indians? How about the Indian removals? How about the Trail of Tears? I don't say that was genocide, but it damn well was ethnic cleansing. Move all the Indians from, from the area east of Mississippi, move them out to Oklahoma or somewhere, uh, and at least for. But Jackson promised them they'd have that land forever, or 10 years, whichever came first. Uh, but Jackson also has fallen down, although I have to be honest here. When you judge someone like Polk or Jackson by what they did in the 1840s or 30s, by the standards of today, that's called presentism or generational chauvinism. It's not fair. It's like me saying that Einstein was stupid because he couldn't do PowerPoint. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not condoning owning slaves. That was terrible, terrible. Another little flaw we had. Uh, but Jackson and Polk owned slaves. They mistreated the Indians. They were warmongers. Sure. But by the standards of the day, they were, they were right in tune with the American ethic, kind of, so to speak. That's not right what we did. Uh, I wish it hadn't happened that way. But to, to, to downgrade them in the ratings account of that, I don't think is very fair. Uh, Jackson, I used to think, was one of our top three presidents. In the last poll, he's down around number 20. Uh, when, when the first one came out in 1948-49, uh, Jackson was ranked third behind Lincoln and Roosevelt. And uh, Now the guy that's come up a lot is Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, is really high now. You know who came up and I always liked this guy? I said to my mother at, way back when, uh, she didn't like him a lot, I said, this guy is really going to be considered a good president someday. Mark my words, Eisenhower. He's now in the top five. Yeah, uh, except for Lincoln, he's the highest ranking Republican president we've ever had. I think he deserves to be there. I, I remember jokes when I was a kid, what's an Eisenhower doll? You wind it up, it does nothing for eight years. Winds it up. <laughs> All right, oh, and this little area here we got in the Treaty of 1818 under Monroe, uh, where it set up that border. All right, and then we got Alaska under Andy Johnson. After the Civil War, Johnson was the guy who took over after Lincoln was shot. He had a very tough presidency. He was a round peg in a square hole. He was really a Democrat, not a Republican. Lincoln had run with them in 1864 because Lincoln ran in kind of a unity ticket called the Union Party, uh, and some Democrats supported Lincoln, so Lincoln promised to take a Democrat for vice president. Turned out to be Andy Johnson. Uh, it didn't work out too well. And then under William McKinley, uh, in the 1890s, we fought the Spanish-American War, and during that war, we annexed Hawaii. And one thing I'll never forget about McKinley, I was reading his book, and McKinley didn't know whether we should take the Philippines. After the Spanish-American War, we not only annexed Hawaii, but we took Puerto Rico, Guam, I'll get into all of this, and the Philippines. And McKinley didn't know whether we should take the Philippines because it was the first major area we were going to take that was non-contiguous to the United States, heavily populated by non-white people. So should we take the Philippines? 
and he, he didn't know what to do. And he very much loved his wife, Ida, who had uh, epilepsy, and he was very, he and Ida were as close as any presidential couple until Clinton's. <laughs> what? But you know what Ida told him? You gotta take the Philippines bill. Why, Ida? Because we have to Christianize them. And we took them. And we held the Philippines until 1946. We had bases there until the 1990s. What's interesting about that? Almost every Filipino was a Catholic because they had been for hundreds of years ruled by Spain. So he was going to Christianize Filipinos. Now, Bill, I have a little argument here. They are Christians, <laughs> but they're not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians. There you go. I, I, I thought that was amazing. Uh, oh, well, what are you going to do? All right, so those are the... Pre oh, Pierce. Uh, it was under Franklin Pierce uh, that we bought the Gadsden Purchase. He was president... Uh, from 1853 until 1857. Uh, I, I love that. He, he fits in with Polk in a way. I got to tell you this one. When Pierce ran for president and won, it was 1852. The last Democrat, and he was a Democrat, the last Democrat who had won was Polk in 1844. The, the Whig Party, which eventually became the Republicans for all intents and purposes, but the Whig Party of Lincoln and Henry Clay and guys like that, the Whig Party won in 1848 under a guy named Zachary Taylor. Oh, rough and ready, he wrote a Mexican War. All right, well, what the, here was the Democrats' slogan, and you think the Democrats are slow, huh? Hey, listen to this one. In 1852, when Pierce was running, the Democrats, Biden needs a slogan like this, came out with this slogan, we poked them in 44, we'll pierce them in 52. We Clinton them in 1992, we'll Biden them in, what was that, 2020. All right, but they're not done counting the votes yet, so don't, don't. don't. <laughs> Mr. Pillow told me, uh-uh, ain't over till it's over. Well, that's what Yogi said, he's dead now. Okay, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. That's Yogi. All right, let's do the American Revolution. To understand why England gave us all this land, why we were born one of the largest countries in the world. And our mother country was, I think, the greatest country in the world at that time. Freest country in a way, it was a, a monarchy, but not by any means an absolute monarchy. By 1776, England was more or less a constitutional monarchy. England has no written constitution, so it never did. They said, we're smart enough, Talk about white Anglo-Saxon Protestant pride. England tells us they don't need a written constitution because they're not stupid. We need one because we're stupid. Well, wait, aren't we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants too? Yeah, but you're in infiltrated by idiots like Lithuanians, Poles, you know. All right, so, but anyhow, here's what you have to remember about the American Revolution. It was fought between 1775, 1783. By 1778, it became a world war. In October of 1777, I think the most important military battle in American history was fought up around Albany, New York, the Battle of Saratoga. If we didn't win this battle against the British, if we didn't win it, there would be no United States. We'd still be speaking English, and we'd still be part... That didn't go over. All right, uh, and we'd still be part of the Commonwealth. But we won that battle, and we captured an army of 6,000 British regulars. Not Canadians, not militiamen, we conquered 6,000 British regulars, including a very famous general named John Burgoyne, who was a very famous actor in England. When a war broke out, he was a general. When there was peace, he was an actor. Kind of like if, if, if we lost a battle and I was a general, so what? But if it was Brad Pitt, It'd make headlines, right? I never understood what he has that I don't. So somebody has to explain that. Uh, but anyhow, anywho, when we won that battle, it proved that we had a chance to win the war, which nobody thought we did. As soon as we won that battle, France came into the war on our side, making it a world war. 
From then on, England wasn't too worried about what we were doing. They were worried about the French. And then France convinced Spain and the Netherlands to declare war against England. And then Catherine the Great of Russia, she didn't like the English, partly because it's Anglo-Saxon stuff. But she had a visceral hatred of England, which went on in Russia maybe to today. But anyhow, Catherine the Great formed something called the League of the Armed Neutrality, which is five countries plus Russia. And they didn't exactly enter the war, but they said, we're neutral, favoring France. And Britain, if you use your navy to screw with our trade, we're declaring war on you. So by 1780, England was fighting us. The French, the greatest land military power in the world. The Spanish, who still had a decent army and navy. The Netherlands, who, which still had a decent navy. Uh, and they were facing this League of the Armed Neutrality, which would, would at least be a, a bulwark against British naval domination. So what are you going to do? It was a world war. Would have we won this war if it didn't become a world war? The answer is hell no. It was World War V. If the French and Indian War, Seven Years' War, was World War IV, this was what? World War V. And this is, there, I'm going to argue in a minute that there were nine world wars. World War I should be called World War VIII, and World War II should be called World War IX. Anyhow, what's going to start in Ukraine tomorrow is World War X. I hope not. That's my mother's, uh, I'm part Ukrainian. It's, uh, Putin better not invade the motherland or I'm joining up. And then uh, wait till a one-legged 70-year-old some man comes out. Then Putin will tremble. But here we, that's what we do have, 70 years. No, that's okay. All right. England was stretched thin, stretched thin. And in 1781, we won our second greatest victory of the war. And really only the second time in this whole war that we won a major victory over the British regulars. Sure, we won some battles fighting British volunteers or Canadians or whatever, but we only won two major, major, major victories against famous British generals commanding regular British redcoats at Saratoga and at Yorktown, which is on the East Coast near Virginia Beach. Uh, 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 an army under Lord Cornwallis, uh, Charles Cornwallis, went down to Yorktown and was waiting, for, he had 8,000 men, and he's waiting for the British Navy to evacuate them, to take them either up to New England to fight again or else into the islands of the Caribbean where France, France was making some trouble for English sugar islands. But when Cornwallis got to Yorktown, something strange happened. Instead of the British Navy being off the shores of Yorktown, it was the French Navy. For the first time in the war, the French Navy helped us. Just by the sheerest of luck, Bismarck, luck, just by the sheerest of crap, luck. Can't put it any other way. The, the Navy that was off the coast of Virginia at that time was not the British Navy, but the French Navy. And George Washington saw this, and for the first time, he had some French soldiers on his side. So Washington had 10,000 Americans, 10,000 Frenchmen under a general named Rochambeau, if you want to know, and he force marched them down to Virginia and came down a peninsula, Yorktown's on the end of a peninsula formed by the York and the James Rivers, and Rochambeau and Washington came down. The, the British kept waiting for their Navy, never came in time, so they were trapped. And Cornwallis, in October of 1781, almost exactly four years after Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga, uh, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, 8,000 men. And when, when Cornwallis surrendered, he was another very famous general. And incidentally, that's the only major battle of the war that Washington won. He lost 10, at least and only won one, I'm major, but Trenton and Princeton, a couple are minor battles. But he, his only major battle, only major victory he had over the uh, regular British Army was at Yorktown. And this was in October 1781. Now everybody said, that ended the war, the British quit. No, they didn't. The war didn't end for two more years. We didn't accept the treaty until 1784. So you're talking two and a half years. So what, that, we beat the British to a pulp at Yorktown. No, 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 no. The British still had 54,000 men in North America, or the islands. 32,000 in the 13 colonies. 
Washington was lucky, lucky, if the total American army regulars totaled 16,000 men. Yeah, he had these militiamen, who some were good, some were ill-trained, whatever, but Washington only had maybe 16,000 Continentals, uh, the regular army, what we now call the RA. But, but the British had 54,000 men, the greatest Navy in the world. Did we beat them to a pulp? No, but they were in trouble elsewhere. Uh, the Rock of Gibraltar was being attacked by the French and the Spanish. The British were worried about losing sugar islands and other islands in the Caribbean. Uh, England was stretched in. Her navy couldn't wreak the havoc it usually did, although it later defeated the, the French navy that had bottled up Cornwallis. But the British just were stretched in. And when Cornwallis surrendered, over 7,000 men, 8,000 counting um, militiamen loyal to England, uh, then Lord North, who was the Prime Minister through the whole war, the infamous Lord North, who George III had great, great respect for, uh, Lord North said, oh my God, it's over, it's over, and he was forced to resign. He was the guy with like wild hair, young wife, and he parties while people are... <laughs> no, that's Boris Johnson, I'm sorry. Uh, what do any women see in that guy? I'm sorry, Brad Pitt, okay. Nah, I mean, he's not Lithuanian range, but okay. Boris Johnson. He looks like he's, he, every, somebody sticks their finger in an electrical outlet. Uh, anyhow, we did not beat the British to a pulp. They continued to fight for two years. But Lord North's government fell. And in his, you know how prime ministers are picked. Uh, you could resign one day and know the guy's there tomorrow. John's could be out tomorrow if they vote no confidence. Then they could have somebody a week from today. They don't have regularly scheduled election or anything like that. All right. So who came in? There was a guy named Rockingham. He was much more friendly to us, and he wanted to uh, win us back as trading partners. He was much more willing to talk to us about independence. Uh, it took two years, but then he died quickly. But as American luck would have it, you went from North, who hated Americans, uh, to Rockingham, who kind of liked this, to a guy named Shelburne, who totally liked this. And he hated France, but he liked the United States, and he wanted to use us as a bulwark against France. And also, Shelburne had this crazy idea that the islands of the Caribbean in Canada were worth a hell of a lot more than 13 American colonies. Because we were trouble, we were hard to police, we were expensive, we were unappreciative, where the Canadians and the Islanders in the Caribbean were much different, much more loyal to England. Uh, Canada never made very few Canadians, if any, came over to our side during the American Revolution, or the War of 1812, for that matter. So here we go. Did we beat the British? No. And the proof of it is Yorktown was not the final battle, the war lingered on. In fact, England did a little better uh, in India and other places after 1781, after October of 1781, because the, the, the Navy took over. A lot of the battles after 1781 were fought on the seas or in areas very close to the coastline that the Navy could play a big role. That's where England is pretty tough to beat, when you were fighting a battle close to the coastline, where the British Navy could always... Yorktown was one of the exceptions. Who benefited by that luck? Us. So. The British decide they will go to a peace conference. But remember, this was a world war. So the British negotiated, this was the only world war of all nine that one side had no allies. England fought alone against us, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the League of the Armed Neutrality. Unbelievable. How she lasted that long, I do not know. But she held on. At the negotiations, which took place in Paris, we sent Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and John Adams, three very great Americans. Uh, Franklin had been in France for the whole war. He was now in his 70s, uh, but still very respected. The French called him Dr. Franklin. Yes, he was drinking too much, uh, but he was still respected around the world as a scientist, poor Richard's almanac. The French named a ship after him, Bonhomme Richard, good man Richard. Uh, that was Benjamin Franklin, Paul Richard's almanac. John Adams was very disturbed with Franklin because he was still chasing women. 
uh, in his mid-70s, and, and Adam's looking at him, who are you kidding, John, or Ben? But Franklin was a good diplomat in his own way. John Adams, excellent, become our next president, lived to see his son become president. And John Jay, uh, you've heard a lot about him. He will go on and become our first Chief Justice. With Hamilton and Madison, he wrote the famed Federalist Papers, which you're hearing so much about today, the Federalist Society, the Federalist This. A lot of conservative organizations now uh, tend to take the name Federalist, uh, and that's partly because of Adams and uh, um, Jay, John Jay School of Law. Uh, Jay was certainly a, a great man. Uh, well, they were negotiating with the French. Thomas Jefferson was supposed to go over as a fourth uh, negotiator, but he was governor of Virginia and begged off. And also a guy named Henry Lawrence, L-A-U-R-E-N-S, he was supposed to go over, but he was captured by the British. He was the only American held captive in the Tower of London uh, during the war, but the British did release him uh, later on to go, and he caught in at the tail end of the negotiations. All right, in our alliance with France in 1778, which brought France into the war. Remember, at Saratoga, our victory, French smell blood, they come in. Convince Spain to come in, convince Holland to come in. Okay, you got that. The alliance of 1778 was supposed to be perpetual, last forever. Yeah, it lasted till 1800. The alliance of 1778 also said, very specifically, that we would never negotiate a separate peace with England. We would only negotiate with France, through France, against England. Not on our own. So here we are, the most honorable, free country in the world. And we go to our first international negotiations. And what do we do? We negotiate separately with the British. How about, we never break our word, do we? We would never imperialize, would we? No. I, the French kind of knew what was going on. It was very intriguing. Uh, Adams hated that you had to bribe people. You had to grease hands just to talk to a certain person. Franklin knew that that's the way you played the game in France and Europe. Uh, Adams was very upset. That's not how God wants it, Franklin. Yeah, but that's how the French want it, so don't worry about God. We got to get some talking going on here. Uh, and the French also were trying to double-cross us, so we kind of double-crossed the French as they were double-crossing us. Plus, the Spanish were there. They wanted something, the Dutch, and it was a very complicated uh, negotiation. But what the British did, and again, this is when Lord North was gone, Rockingham came in, Shelburne came in, so the British were in flux, but every change of government, prime minister, brought in a more pro-American, anti-French guy, which was to our advantage. And the British gave us everything we could possibly want. They gave us our independence, which North and George III would have never approved. Uh, they gave us our independence, and they gave us all the land to the Mississippi. They could have cooped us up east of the mountains, right? But they gave us all this land to the Mississippi, all the land from Canada, the Great Lakes, down to Florida. He gives all of that. We were born one of the richest, best endowed country in the history of the world. What other nations fought centuries for, we were handed at the stroke of a pen. Are we lucky? Why was the Shelburne government so willing to do this? Why were the British willing to kind of kiss our tails? Because they demanded more from the French and Spanish then, or gave less. The French got a, an area of uh, Africa called Senegal. Now, would you take the Louisiana area or Senegal? All right, take a guess. All right, so uh, the British gave us all of that, gave us our independence, and I think it's my, yeah. Here was the big argument. That's the Ohio River. You see the Ohio River? Was that area part of Canada, Quebec, the 14th colony, or was it part of the 13 American colonies? In 1774, the British had passed a law called the Quebec Act, which said that area was part of Quebec, of Upper Canada, and extended down to the Ohio. They did it just for simplicity. That's obvious. You should go down the Ohio River and the Mississippi in the west and the mountains on the east. That, but that block should be part of Quebec, part of Canada, partly because the Canadians were more loyal, causing less trouble than we were. 
All right, well, who would that land go to? Would it stay with Quebec or would it go to us? The British gave it to us. That became the old Northwest. The British were very willing to concede us to land east of the Mississippi and south of that. But why did they give us that? Uh, and it really upset the Canadians who said, look, we were loyal to you during the war. We fought for you. Now you're giving this valuable land. You're giving it to the, 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 the bad rebels, the United States. Why not leave it with us? But uh-uh. Uh, we, 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 we got it. We got it. And out of that old Northwest was formed Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, a little bit of Minnesota, Illinois. Come on. That was a tremendous area. Uh, and and, and that, that's what, not only our independence, not only the great landed gift, uh, but also that area. Why did the British, why were they so generous? They wanted to win us back as trading partners. Shelburne thought if they gave us all of this land to the Mississippi and all of that land, which any idiot could see was good farmland, if they gave us that land, we would remain farmers. And who would be the best traders, trading nation with England, uh, 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 an industrializing factory nation? A farmer country, and that would be us. We'd be farmers forever. Yeah. And also, they didn't uh, count on our breeding and on our immigrants pouring in. But, uh, and then if they gave us all of this land, including especially that, we would never, ever, ever be greedy enough to try to take what? Canada. At least not for another year. So the British figured... No way, if they gave us all of this land, including that valuable area around the Great Lakes and down in the Ohio River, if they gave us, that's the Ohio Valley, for God's sake. Arguably the most lush valley in the world at that time. Uh, and they, they, this would keep us farmers, good trading partners. It would prevent an alliance with France. It would break up that perpetual alliance. So the British were very generous. And they, they used that by getting us off their backs. That enabled them to be stronger in the negotiations, holding out for fewer concessions to either France or Spain or anybody else. So you could see how luck is playing out again. I, what's interesting, and I'll be done in a minute. In 1781, during the war, before these negotiations, in 1781, we had adopted our first written government, not the Constitution, but something called the Articles of Confederation. And if you're a conservative, small government Republican, I'm serious. Read the Articles of Confederation, it's online. That is your perfect government. If you like states' rights, a weak government that can't tax, go back to the Articles. Uh, you'll be orgasmic when you hear that one. Uh, I mean, couldn't tax, couldn't tax. And the states had not low taxes, no taxes. How about that one? All right. But anyway, if you read the Articles of Confederation, now not the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, which ruled us from 1781 till they were replaced by the Constitution in 1789. Article 11 of the Articles of Confederation, again, not the Constitution. Article 11 says this. If the United States becomes independent, which we did, and we want to add any new territories, Nine of the 13 states had to approve. Say we wanted to add Florida. Well, nine of the 13 states had to what? Approve. Unless it's Canada. Then Canada could come in automatically without a vote. So the British are trying to keep us out of Canada. And if they could read the Articles of Confederation, right in there we said we wanted what? Canada. Are you kidding me? But they, they let it fly. And that was, I mean, amazing. Then when the War of 1812 starts, we try to invade Canada, and so on. But th that was, so the, what I want you to remember till tomorrow is that the uh, American Revolution was a world war. And if I could get down to my, I'll do it here. Because I've been harping on this, let me just get to here. There are the nine world wars, and I promise I'll stop. It's a little after three. They told me I could go to 3.30, but I know you don't want that. Uh, my wife's had to listen to me for 53 years, so don't. We, we would have got divorced, except we're Catholic, and that would be a sin. So, all right. The War of the League of Augsburg. Some people will question these first three. The War of the League of Augsburg, the War of Spanish Succession, the War of Austrian Succession. 
But they weren't world wars, and everyone had England against France. What was common about these first seven world wars, sides changed, but it was always England against what? France, the world's greatest navy against the world's greatest army, the world's greatest Protestant power against the world's greatest Catholic power. Uh, but anyway, then you had the Seven Years' War, or the Great War for Empire. Then the American Revolution became World War V. And again, the United States is in it. We're not the United States yet, but the United States, France, England, Spain, Netherlands, the League of the Armed Neutrality. And then the, when the French Revolution started in 1789, and that was a direct result of the American Revolution because France was broke and had a tax people and it caused all kind of nonsense. And then the French Revolution started in 1789 and then the French cut their king's head off. Uh, and then that sort of made the rest of the kings of, Eng of Europe a little mad. And they started a war with France, which was, we call collectively the World War the French Revolution. And then there was a brief period of peace that England was, or Europe was almost constantly at war between 1793 and 1815. There was a very brief Peace called the Peace of Amiens between the wars of the French Revolution and Napoleonic struggles. But what happened in 1802 is Napoleon was beginning to become the total ruler of France, and in 1804 he would declare himself emperor, and uh, that would start another war, which was called the Napoleonic Wars, and they would go on until 1815. Actually, 1814, Napoleon was defeated, exiled Elba, but he snuck back, started the war up again, and was finally defeated at Waterloo in 1815. So almost constantly between 1793 and 1815, except for a couple of brief periods of peace, uh, there was war in Europe, and we took advantage of that too. Uh, and then, so therefore, World War I should be World War VIII, and World War II should be World War IX. And we are a great peace-loving country. <laughs> How many of those nine world wars, either as English subjects or Americans, do we get involved in? Nine for nine. <laughs> These first three, they were fought a little bit over here. We fought mainly the Indians, but we fought. And every other war, we were involved in. We never met a good world war we couldn't stay out of. <laughs> All right, so, all right, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, it's great to be back.